Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this first technical webinar in the 2022 series from the LoRa Alliance. Uh, our topic today is guidance and recommendations for LoRaWAN end devices and implementers. Uh, and we'll go through several different sections today uh, to, uh, to, uh, to bring you up to date and all the latest uh, guidance from the LoRa Alliance. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, uh, if you see your video or audio is behind, pressing the F5 key on your keyboard will refresh your screen and this typically will, will resolve any issues. There's also a toolbar at the bottom of your screen and pressing the help box will take you to information on how to solve most technical issues. On your screen where you can see the questions box is where you can submit your questions for the presenters throughout the webcast and panelists will be answering those questions at the end. And lastly, an on-demand version of this webcast will be available within 24 hours of the live recording. So to begin, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. My name is Dave Schendel. I am the Chief Technical Officer at Senate. Uh, I am also the Chair of the Regional Parameters Working uh, Group, as well as a member of the Board Alliance of the uh, LoRa Alliance. Um, I'd like to hand over to Olivia Seller to introduce himself as well. Hello everyone, thank you for joining today. I am Olivier Seller from Semtech. I am technical fellow at Semtech and at the Lower Islands, I am the uh, vice chair of the technical committee. And uh, I now hand over it to Alper, who's going to present himself. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, this is Alper again. I'm the VP of Advanced Technology Development and Activity. I'm also the chair of the technical committee and vice chair of the board in Lower Alliance. Now back to you, Dave. Thank you, gentlemen. So to get things kicked off here, I'd like to just set the table in terms of what it is that we're going to be talking about. So we're looking specifically at two technical recommendations that were produced by the Technical Committee of the Lower Alliance. And we're gonna go through some of the high points of these recommendations, uh, not point by point, but just show you the guidance, um, describe to you the context and the meaning behind the recommendations that were, that were made. Uh, we have two that we'll be discussing here today. Uh, the first is preventing state synchronization issues around LoRaWAN, uh, and the second is developing the LoRaWAN end devices, um, technical recommendation seven. Um, we are not structuring the uh, webinar in such a manner as so that uh, each one is handled independently. Instead, we're going to mix these together in a way that makes sense as you are thinking about the problems you may encounter or the opportunities that you have as you're building, uh, building your solutions and, and your end devices. Uh, we'll hit some of the um, uh, common pitfalls, guidance on the things that the technical specifications left uh, to the implementers as choices in what our intent was behind that. Uh, and then highlighting as well how you properly in, uh, configure and provision end devices uh, from the very beginning. With that, uh, we'll jump right in, uh, start talking about some of the requirements uh, for persistent storage on the end devices. Uh, there's two different kinds of end devices fundamentally uh, with respect to this in the, uh, the, the technical specifications. Over the air activated end devices, OTA devices, uh, which perform a joint procedure in order to gain uh, connectivity with the network. Uh, these devices uh, are required to support uh, persisting uh, through a power loss or through a reset. Uh, their identifier, which we call the WUI, the device EUI, as well as the identifier that, um, uh, that uh, addresses the join server that will be handling the request, which we call the join EUI. Uh, it will also need to persist any root keys that are going to be used, and there's different root keys for LoRaWAN 1.0 and 1.1, as well as the device nonce and the join nonce, which are the salts that are used to generate the session keys, uh, the unique session keys that are generated at the end of each, or through the process of each join procedure. For over-the-air uh, over devices, activated devices that do not perform a new, a new join procedure when they are reset or when they lose power, they will also then need to, to uh, persist everything that we'll talk about in the ABP requirements next. Activation by personalization or ABP, these are devices that do not perform the joint procedure. Um, they are provisioned out of band before they are uh, attempt to join, get connectivity with the network with the information that is conveyed to them uh, to a device through the joint procedure in the over the air case. So in addition to the device UI, um, which is a now requirement on the end device as of 1.04 of the specification. Um, the ABP device must also store its device address, its session keys, and its frame counters. In addition to that, class B devices um, and devices that have been dynamically provisioned by the network for uh, configuration and performance on the network 
Uh, and Olivia will talk about those capabilities later, have a whole other set of things that they need to persist so that when they come back from that reset, the network and the end device are still in synchronization with the configuration that the network applied to that end device. So we won't go through all the details here, but it's basically all of the elements that can be configured by the network or can be set dynamically need to be persisted in that case. Frame counter handling is another important topic. So the frame counters are an integral part of the security solution for LoRaWAN. Um, as of uh, 1.04, the most recent uh, LoRaWAN specification, as well as 1.0, 1.1 uh, and beyond, all frame counters need to be 32-bit frame counters. Um, and we recommend that for all devices, uh, really regardless. That was optional prior to those specifications, but it is required now, and we recommend that regardless. Uh, shorter frame counters are really just not sufficiently secure, and they can potentially allow for replay attacks. <clears throat> The frame counters should also only be incremented by a single uh, value upon actual frame transmission. Um, this enables the receiver, either the end device or the network, uh, to identify loss of frames by the gaps in the frame counters that they are uh, observing. So this is very important and may be used by the network or the end device to make additional changes in order to accommodate uh, the issues, um, that the coverage issues that may be uh, related to that. There can be exceptions to this. Um, so one of the exceptions, and we won't get into the detail here, um, is when we talk about coordinated transmission um, and look for something coming out of the lower lines in future around, around how that might work. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about channel plans. Um, so there's, uh, there can be a lot of confusion on this topic. Uh, fundamentally, there are two different kinds of channel plans that we've, uh, that we've defined uh, in the regional parameters document. Uh, and all of the dozen or so plans that we have fall into one of these two categories today. So dynamic channel plans are uh, identified by a small number of default channels, two or three default channels, over which the end device will join the network, uh, in which, uh, in the absence of a CF list, also describe the initial channels that it will be using. In a fixed channel plan, there's a very, very large number of default channels. Um, in uh, most of the plans today, that is uh, 64 or 72, depending on how you look at it. Um, and uh, historically, that fixed channel plan regions were not uh, enabled with the ability to add any additional channels uh, to those plans. Um, that's something that, that is going to be changing in the future, where all plans will be able to cap uh, support that capability. Important things, all the default channels are enabled by default, I guess, obviously. Um, additional channels may be created through this new channel rec command. Um, and then channels, regardless of the plan, uh, are enabled and disabled through link ADR commands. Uh, and, uh, and finally, end devices should support more than just the bare minimum of channels. So in some of the, uh, uh, some of the regional plans, uh, historically, they've been looked at as maybe an eight channel region or a 16 channel region. But with this ability to add new channels, it really is uh, very valuable for the device to support more than that minimum. So typically going forward, we're recommending somewhere between 24 and 80, depending upon the region. And that's documented in the regional parameters um, specification. Now, one of the challenges that has existed uh, for uh, devices operating in fixed channel plan regions is that many networks didn't support all of the default channels. And that meant that the device, when it was trying to join that network, it would take some time as it uh, probed to see through sending join requests where the network could answer uh, on that. Now, one of the things that can be done to optimize this uh, and is now explicitly documented in the regional parameters specification, but uh, it did not used to be, is that the end device uh, should scan through the channels by sending a join request respecting the duty cycle and congestion avoidance requirements um, of the different banks of likely support. So when we talk about the U.S. and the Australia regions, which are used uh, not just in the U.S. and Australia, but also throughout Latin America, um, that many networks may only support are eight, six, eight or 16 channels of the total 64. And in this case, um, what, it, it, what makes sense is for the device to try a pseudo-random channel within each group of eight channels as it works its way up there, and to do that progressively until each bank has been probed, uh, and then repeat that process. And it only occasionally using the DR4 channels, which are uh, have the, the least propagation to acquire that network. And then secondly, the end device should transmit its next data frame, the first uplink, on a pseudo-random channel within the same bank as it successfully joined the network on. That, again, will give it the highest probability of 
uh, getting in contact and getting the correct channel plan from the network. Of course, CF list support is the way to do this, and we strongly recommend uh, all devices support CF list for all regions. Now, when we're talking about the join procedure, um, optimizing that, it's all great. But the other thing that we see in the in the uh, in the wild, as it were, very frequently, is improper use of the join procedure. So, fundamentally, the session between the end device and the, and the network is between the end device and the network server, the centralized network server. So that means there's really no um, driving region for the device to rejoin like there is in Wi-Fi or cellular networks. Um, and as a result of that, we recommend that the device should join as infrequently as possible. Um, this minimizes the amount of energy that will be expended. It minimizes the opportunity for state uh, synchronization issues with the back end and these sorts of things. So use the join procedure in a very limited way. Prior to LoRaWAN 1.1, this was the path that you would use to refresh your session keys. So again, you know, from a general perspective, this is something that we would imagine might make sense to do once a year, um, certainly no more than once a month in most LoRaWAN applications. So a very infrequent um, performance. The other thing to keep uh, an eye out for is how the device handles its end of battery life condition. So as that battery wears down, many of these devices uh, use lithium chemistry batteries that have a very, very sharp drop off at the end of their life. And that sharp drop off is exacerbated by a high current activity. Transmission of a frame is usually the highest current activity that most of these end devices will ever do. And that can cause a brownout. What is a real problem is that if the end device doesn't notice that happens, comes back from the reset and immediately sends another join request. At this point, it may be in danger of violating both the LoRa Alliance requirements for congestion avoidance and back off, but also local regulatory requirements for that as well. So it's important to detect that brownout condition. Almost all MCUs let you do this. And if that is occurring, make the decision either to stop the device permanently or at a minimum to continue to obey the duty cycle requirements uh, before, uh, before the device tries to join again. A few more slides uh, on my section here, really just to talk about network connectivity uh, and what to do with this. So um, the, uh, one of the challenges is, is identifying these devices that are sending you know, a relatively small number of messages and receiving a small number of messages is how to detect when you are out of range of the network and what to do with that. Um, so the most um, effective way is to use the ADR capabilities, and uh, Alidia will go into more detail there. But part of that is this capability to use the ADR Act request uh, to solicit a downlink from the network to prove that connectivity still exists. And if you don't get that ADR Act uh, acknowledgement, then the device backs out of its ADR configuration to a configuration that has um, a better link margin, ultimately re-enabling all channels and going back to, to the, the default state that it existed in when it tried to join the network from a, uh, from a data rate and a channel perspective. Um, the devices that do not support ADR may use other mechanisms to do that. They may use an application uh, message to solicit a downlink. They may send a link check request or send confirmed uplinks. Any of these will solicit a downlink from the end device. However, it's important to not react immediately to the loss of a single downlink in that environment. So the ADR algorithm defines this very completely, and we recommend that devices that are using other techniques follow a similar back off mechanism that enables the lossy reality of, our, of these networks to, uh, to, to, um, uh, to influence the rate at which they back off to their, um, to their default configurations. So, a few things here uh, in terms of what should the end device do if it detects that network connectivity is lost. Um, so there are um, kind of the, the most obvious and the most common case is you're just out of coverage. So for whatever reason, the network connectivity is not there. The ADR back off algorithm defines the only appropriate response for the end device in that case. So you just back off, you go to your best link margin, and now you can continue to, to operate in, in when you're maybe moving or the network is changing, get back in coverage of the network. Another thing that can occur very, very rarely is a loss of synchronization between the end device and the network. This is not uh, a function of the LoRa uh, WAN protocol in any way, but maybe something happened. Maybe there was a catastrophic event in the back end and the network server was, you know, missed some of the data that it needed to restore. So this usually only occurs in a very, very short window after a new security session is established. 
Um, in LoRaWAN 1.1, we added rejoin type one messages in order to facilitate this, which is a, a, a non-impacting um, uh, non message that can solicit a new security session if the back end has lost that state. Uh, in 1.0, we don't have that technique. So in this case, um, there may be conditions where after completing the complete ADR back off um, and an additional um, ADR limit number of messages to initiate, initiate a new join procedure. However, it's important to remember that if you do this, it terminates the existing session with the back end. Um, and that means that you can't send any more uplinks until that has been completed. So it's something to do really as only the last resort uh, in those environments. And then finally, as we're talking about the changes that may occur in the networks and various things like this, one of the things that um, is often lost uh, when people are implementing class B or C devices that are receiving downlinks from the network for very long periods of time without maybe sending uplinks is that if the network changes or the device's position potentially with respect to the network changes, it is important to let the network know this, to send an uplink occasionally to make sure that the network has the best knowledge about where the end device is. Um, the end device may detect that itself, that it moved. It may detect that by listening to class B beacons that are sent from, uh, from the network. Uh, or, uh, and I guess regardless, really a class B or CN device should just periodically send a few uplinks in order to make sure that the network's knowledge uh, is up to date um, at, at all times. So you could see, imagine something like this for uh, something like a, um, uh, you know, a, a switch that was controlling lights, they're class C, they're enabled all the time, they're just listening for the command to turn the light on or off. However, if that network changes uh, for whatever reason, gateways are added, gateways are removed, now still we need to know from the network what is the appropriate gateway to use in order to connect with that device. So I want to thank you for the opportunity for sharing uh, these recommendations and this guidance. Um, I strongly recommend uh, that you review the technical recommendations themselves and of course the specifications. Uh, and with that, I'd like to hand the uh, presentation over to my colleague, Olivier Seller. Olivier. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thanks a lot. Um, so I will start talking about adaptive data rate, maybe not start, but uh, detail what you mentioned about it. Uh, adaptive data rate is about optimizing the, um, the use of the spectrum, and it's important to understand that this is done on four dimensions uh, controlled by the network. Th these four dimensions are the data rate, the repetition order, the transmit power and the set of channels that the end device is going to use. And each of this, this dimension optimize the uh, power consumption slash um, versus uh, connectivity performance trade-off for the end device. And the network is doing that for the end device. So the data rate is going to be adjusted to maximize connectivity and limit the time on air. The transmit power is going to limit the power consumption and also amount of energy which which would be sent uh, on the medium once the data rate is at its maximum. Uh, the repetition order, and that's something which is often overlooked, uh, is, is important to benefit from, from the propagation diversity, from the diversity, from the frequency diversity which is present in the channel. So it really depends on the environment, but typically for a static end device, uh, the optimum repetition is uh, four times. So uh, this is the NB trans parameters and it, it equals four. And last but not least, the uh, ADR is going to adjust the channel plan to optimize the connectivity. For instance, if a, if a channel is interfered, well, then a Mac command is going to uh, disable that channel locally or, or, or globally uh, in the network. Maybe also some channels will be reserved for, for, for weak devices or for devices which need to transmit a lot. That, that's up to the network to optimize the channel plan. Uh, the network is responsible for adaptive data rate because the network knows better. The network knows better the, prop the propagation condition of the end device, of each end device. And that's because the network receives all, if not, well, most uplinks, if not all uplinks, and it also received all the copies of the uplinks on, on the various gateways, which are going to uh, detect such uh, uplinks. Uh, thanks to this micro diversity, the network can detect 
that a, that a device, that an end device is, is mobile uh, versus static. The network, also, of course, also knows uh, itself. It knows the density of the gateways in the network, the interferences. It knows also uh, which, which devices it needs to serve. So the network knows better. And that's why the network is going to optimize these four dimensions of adaptive data rate for the end device. Uh, as a result, we recommend strongly uh, uh, the use of adaptive data rate. Uh, and specifically, once adaptive data rate is, is turned on on the end device, that end device needs to follow the four dimensions. It, 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 it needs to follow the list of channels to use, the transmit power, the data rate, and also the retransmission order. And that's because there's a contract uh, going on between the network and the and and the end device uh, and the end device owner. The network uh, commits to optimize uh, adaptive data rate for a certain uh, quality of service. And and we also recommend that end device owner and network operators agree on a device profile, uh, which is a uh, typically for for the case of ADR a, mobi a type of mobility and also a Greek contract on a message success rate. Um, the two additional uh, recommendations that we make in, in, the, uh, in, in the documents that we're talking about today is to use the default backoff speed in the ADR backoff procedure that Dave has talked about already, that, that uh, these parameters are defined in the regional parameters document. And if, in case these parameters are slightly adjusted, they need to be documented in the end device profile, because the network needs to know at what speed uh, the end device is going to back off. For transmit power, we have recently uh, we have introduced in uh, version 104 a minimum range for power control. So it's uh, around, uh, I think it's 14, yeah, 14 dB minimum of power control, and and, and also the capability to transmit as low as uh, 2 dBm. But such a minimum power control range is important to not overload the network with, with power. It's going to help a little bit the, uh, the uh, power consumption of the end device, but not that much because, of course, the chips, the radio in the chips are optimized for a certain level of power, and, and below that level, they're not as efficient. But typically, you can divide by, say, four, uh, at least the power consumption when you reduce the power of the end device. Uh, last, uh, on, on this slide, uh, I would like to emphasize on the contract and the commitment from the network operator to the uh, end device owner for a certain success rate uh, of, of the message delivery. And as a result, uh, you need to be careful if you implement blind repetition, that's not recommended at the application level because this may be inefficient. Uh, if, if the network is, is trying to optimize for, say, 95% message to sex rate, it's, it's really a waste of power to repeat at the application level each, uh, each piece of data to be sure that it's going to be received. It's much better in that situation to, to do um, acknowledgements either on the network level, at the, at the protocol level, or at the application level. Um, so use ADR, respect the four dimensions of ADR. And that's going to optimize the uh, power consumption of the, of the end device too. So another set of optimization of the spectrum uh, these two are th at the end device level, so it's the, respons the individual responsibility of the end device to do that. The third thing is to stop retransmission once uh, a downlink has been received, since a downlink can only be, a class A downlink can only be received once an uplink has been successfully processed by the network. Of course, it means that there's no need to retransmit that uplink because it, it's been received for sure. So an end device uh, needs to stop the retransmission of a message once a, a class A downlink has been received. So that's mandatory in 104. It was a recommendation before, but we strongly recommend that it's always the case. The second thing is duty cycle limitation. So regulation, uh, which is not law, what LoRaWAN is about. LoRaWAN is, uh, is not 
is, is adapting to regulation, is not enforcing regulation, of course. But regulation sometimes impose duty cycle limitations, typically in Europe, and that's per end device or gateway and per sub-band when, when this happens. Uh, and on top of that, uh, LoRa1 may add duty cycle limitation to improve the network performance mainly. So if there is a risk of network congestion locally, or maybe if, if an end device is, is talking too much, is sending too many uplinks, sorry, the, the, the duty cycle rec Mac command is there to impose another duty cycle uh, uh, constraint. And the end device needs to use the lowest uh, of the network imposed and regulation imposed duty cycles. So last on spectrum use optimization, here are two recommendations which, which, um, which, which are important for groups of end devices. So of course, each end device is going to individually uh, act upon these recommendations, but uh, it's, it concerns groups of end devices. Since LoRa1 is an uh, ALOA, meaning random access type protocol, the capacity and the quality of service or maximized when when everything is random, when the transmit time is, is random, when the safety channels are random. So it's important that over groups of end devices, they stay random. So for instance, it's important to avoid synchronous behavior between end device. Um, at the end device level, it, it means, well, we recommend that each end device picks um, a random list of the enabled channels and then cycles through through them. So it's not random each time. So it's it's a random list and then that list is is um, is cycled through. Um, whenever there is a periodic transmission, and that's often the case with LoRa1 and devices, typically they, they transmit maybe a couple of times a day. Well, that should not be at noon and midnight. Uh, there should be a random delay to any periodic transmission. And alike, there should not be group coordination to transmit at the same time or within the same time window. So like avoid to transmit uh, something at noon for uh, all end devices of a network. That's, that's, um, that's very inefficient and that increases a lot the risk of, of collision. And um, also limit the periods that forbid transmission, because for the same reason, if, if, if some period is forbidden for transmission, then the rest of the time, <laughs> you're going to have more traffic, then more risk of collision. So if you have short periods of time without transmission, that's okay, but this should not be too long. Last on spectrum use optimization for groups of end devices is our uh, congestion collapse avoidance mechanism. So some events, can trigger a group or even a few number of devices to transmit simultaneously. And that can be a power outage, then the end, when the end devices come back to life, they will act uh, synchronously if, if they are designed to do so. It can be a network outage, it can be jamming, well, it can be anything which, which makes a group of end devices go off and then go, go, go back on. Uh, with connectivity. It could also be an earthquake uh, or anything which will trigger an alarm from a group of end devices. And, and typically the end devices will transmit simultaneously upon such events and whenever they don't receive an answer from the network, they will go on transmitting the same kind of request or reports or alarms. So the recommendation and, and it's actually mandatory uh, in, in, in our spec, uh, in, in the letter spec, uh, is to back off transmission times whenever the network answer, the expected answer is not received. And then, of course, not only back off, but also add random delay to the, to the initial request of the end devices. And importantly, this also applies to join request frames. So though these join request frames are infrequent, some events may make them frequent for a group of devices like a network outage. So with this, uh, I will thank you once again for, for listening today and I hand over to Alper. Thank you, Olivier. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in this last part of the uh, webinar, I'll talk about the security-related recommendations. 
And the first part of that is identification of the end device. So as you have heard from uh, Dave Chandel, <clears throat> our devices have a permanent uh, globally unique device identifier called DevEUI. These identifiers are generated based on using an IEEE OUI based prefix. So the prefix part is, belongs to an organization that gets this assignment from IEEE. And that's how we ensure the whole DevUI can be globally unique. Uh, we do see cases of devices in the field that has a randomly assigned DevUI. The problem with that approach is it is likely such a DevUI will collide with someone else's device, which will, uh, which will turn one or both devices in, um, in, inoperable in, in, in all networks. So uh, Dave EUI is equivalent to an Ethernet MAC address, <clears throat> and we're sure that people do appreciate the MAC addresses should be unique. And then the another identifier that we use on the end device is DevEdder. This is a network assigned address, and this address is assigned by the network server, and it is generated based on a NetID that should be configured on the network server. The NetID may be a value assigned by the Lore Alliance, and now Lorelai assigns net IDs to both members and non-members, or it can be a, a private experimental value, which is uh, value zero and one, and out of that, this address can be assigned. Once again, randomly assigning device addresses would create a problem for the end device, especially in the case of roaming. Thanks to the prefix part that's driven from the net ID, the visitor networks can recognize the home network of the end device. In case the prefix part is randomly assigned, such a device would never find a home. Um, and again, about the uh, over-the-air activation device and the activation by personalization, personalization devices, the OTA devices shall have a dev EUI and they should also have a join EUI. In the older versions of our specifications, you would see app EUI terms used, which later we have um, replace that with join UI. And this is the identifier of the join server, which is the entity that holds a copy of this metric key used for authenticating the end device. And um, again, inside that join UI, the prefix part is based on an IEEE OUI, which is an assigned value by IEEE. And once again, building devices or configuring devices with random join UI would cause these devices not to join ever. So that's another place to pay attention. And finally, for the OTA devices, <clears throat> in 1.0 specifications, the link layer 1.0 specifications, we have an app key, a single root key. And with 1.1 and moving forward, we have two root keys, app key and network key. These should be randomly generated per device keys. So using the same key on multiple devices, or having an easy to guess values used is a sure recipe for jeopardizing the whole security of the connectivity. And not only the value should be randomly generated and per device, but it should be securely delivered and stored on the end device. In case these keys are compromised in transit or on the end device that would, that would break the whole connectivity security, <clears throat> And, and um, so for that reason, a lot of attention needs to be paid to generation and delivery and storage of such keys. Now, when we look at the ABP devices, which skip the joint procedure, that's why they need to be configured with a device address, DevEdder, which maps to a network server for which this uh, ABP device is provisioned for, and the session keys. Instead of having the root keys, <clears throat> the session keys are provisioned on the end device. And still the session keys needs to be randomly generated and per device and securely delivered and stored um, on, on, the, on the end device and also on the, on the network server, the joint server. Now, um, the device address, again, should not be randomly assigned. It should respect the uh, use of a prefix that's obtained uh, from IEEE, uh, based on IEEE OUI. Now, even though device ID, DevUI, is not used over the air, ABP devices shall still have a DevUI for unique identification within the, uh, within the device management systems. 
And due to the dynamic nature of OTA, which can generate session keys and recession the whole session, um, sorry, rekey the whole session, um, and also it allows devices to not, not having to be provisioned for a specific network server in their lifetime, being able to be provisioned on different network servers throughout their lifetime, we highly recommend using OTA. <clears throat> there might be cases where an AVP use might be necessary. For example, if the device cannot perform the joint procedure, cannot receive a downlink frame, in which case it'll be stuck with AVP. But th those are very uh, corner cases. And in case the keys, um, in case the device maker or the device owner wants to have a hardware level security for safeguarding the cryptographic keys and their generation, we recommend using secure elements. Secure elements are a piece of hardware that are hardened against physical uh, intrusion, and they have the equivalent level of security that you would get out of SIM cards in, in cellular networks. <clears throat> and we have one more uh, technical recommendation that we have published. It's uh, technical recommendation number five that describes a QR code format which embeds uh, dev EUI, join EUI, vendor ID, and other attributes. And through the standard QR format, now we are facilitating easy onboarding of end devices without having to hand type such identifiers or copy paste from computer or receive such IDs over an uh, attachment as an Excel. Now we have the ability to embed them on a sticker that comes on the box or on the end device. Um, and and in, in terms of how to efficiently run the joint procedure, um, as again you had seen in Dave's uh, slides, uh, in order to um, create freshness for the whole joint procedure, the end device and the joint server, they inject a variance, a salt into the, into the computation. The device sends a, a dev nonce value and the joint server sends a join nonce. These values are supposed to be um, one-time um, values, not to repeat, in order to ensure freshness. And in the earlier versions of our specifications, uh, we had referred to both having them as um, random values, randomly generated, and also as counters. Moving forward with these recommendations, and also starting with 1.1.0 and also 104 specifications, we recommend these values to be based on counters. So when the join server uh, generates the join nonce as a monotonically incremented counter, it makes the life of the end device very easy to, to, to check if the received uh, join nonce is a fresh one. It just checks what the last value it had received, and if the new value is greater than the last received one, that's easy. Without having to keep a history of all the previously observed join nonces, end device can easily detect if a join nonce value is fresh or a, or a replayed one. And for that, obviously, end device needs to have a non-volatile memory. Across reboots, it should remember the last observed and accepted join nonce value. <clears throat> so this is mandatory in 1.1.0 specification moving forward, but in the previous specifications, it wasn't so. That's why we provided that as an additional technical recommendation to ease the deployment, uh, to ease the implementation of end devices. And similarly, when the end device sends a dev nonce, we recommend it be a monotonically incremented counter value, which will make the life of a joint server very easy. Again, it'll just keep track of the last accepted dev nonce value, and it'll expect the feature wants to be a greater value than that. Now, given that dev nonce value is a two octet value, it can have up to 65,000 values. And in case the device may run out of them, we do not recommend going back to zero value. Instead, the device should switch to another join EUI, which points to the same join server, and start from the beginning. The, the dev nonce context uses the join EUI in its um, set. So it's okay to use the same dev nonce with a different join UI, as long as dev nonce doesn't repeat itself for the same join UI. So under such circumstances, if a join server is serving devices that may run out of 65,000 dev nonces, that join server should have multiple join UIs, and the end device should be configured with multiple join UIs, and they should be able to roll over to a new join UI 
the moment they deplete the whole Demnon space for a given join, join EOI. And finally, uh, for the Class C devices, upon receiving the join accept, even though the end device is now ready to accept a Class C downlink, the network server doesn't know that. The network server doesn't know if the end device had received the join on accept or not. So in order to deal with this uncertainty, what we recommend is the end device upon receiving and accepting join accept, it shall send an uplink frame, either a confirmed uplink frame or a MAC command that will trigger a response, a downlink back from the network server. So thanks to that additional round trip, now the network server has a confirmation that the end device had received the join accept and had rolled over to the new security context. As such, if there's any pending Class C downlink, the network server can uh, safely transmit that to the end device. Now, we have mandated this um, additional round trip in 1.0.4 specification, but in case you are implementing an earlier version of our uh, link there spec, we recommend you, um, you use this uh, additional uh, step as well. <clears throat> and finally, in order to ensure session freshness, so with the OTA devices in 1.0 uh, version of our specification, the end device can join again, which would reset all the session. Unfortunately, it'll also reset the radio parameters. That's why in a future version, version in 1.1.0, we have the rejoin request type two, which retains the RF parameters while uh, refreshing the session keys. The value of refreshing the session keys is in case you would like to narrow down the, the attack surface stemming from crypt, uh, crypto analysis, you might want to refresh your session keys before they get overly used across too many messages. So you have a way to do that with the OTA devices and unfortunately not so with the ABP which is another handicap of using ABP. And the counter base, never repeating dev nonce and join nonce, um, I had already talked about that. And in terms of the frame counters, um, in the earlier versions of our specification, the end device implementer could use 16-bit counters, which had, runs the risk of wrapping around. And, and in order to avoid that, now starting with 104, we made using 32-bit frame counters mandatory. And in case you are using an earlier version of our specification, so we recommend you not to use 16-bit frame counters and instead use 32. That will give you a pretty good runway to ensure freshness in every message that is uh, crypto protected. So in short, um, in this webinar, we've gone over several uh, recommendations. Um, a uh, number of things are left to implementations in our uh, interoperable to spec, the link layer spec. And through recommendations, we provide guidance in terms of how to, um, how to enhance your implementation to deal with various cases. And in these documents, we also provide the background about why we, we have such recommendations and and such mandates in our specification. And we also talked about the common pitfalls to avoid and, and, and how to configure the end devices so that they, they operate properly. So this webinar, this presentation was a summary of what you would see in the technical recommendation one and seven, but this is not meant to be a substitute for your reading those documents because there's a whole lot more um, background and explanations in those documents. So we highly recommend after this webinar you go through those documents as well. And for any feedback and suggestions, which we'll also have a, a Q&A in this session, but after the Q&A, please do reach out to us by sending us an email at admin at laura-alliance.org. We would welcome your uh, feedback, especially based on your experience to enhance our documentation and guidance to the ecosystem. And a couple um, additional announcements. Um, we have two more upcoming events, I mean, webinars to cover our technical committee uh, uh, specifications. Uh, one is about the new modulation LRFHSS, which I'm sure you're hearing it about the satellite-based satellite uh, Lorwine gateways. So in April 12th, uh, Olivia Seller will deliver a webinar on this new modulation. 
And on May 10th, we have a webinar on uh, firmware update over the air. Julian Catalano will be delivering that webinar. So you're very welcome to already register for these upcoming events. And um, in case you are not already a member of the Lore Alliance, we would highly encourage you to join. Um, each of us presenting on this webinar today are active Lore Alliance members, active in several uh, committees and groups. And if you are not yet a member of the Lore Alliance, there are numerous benefits to becoming a member. You can click the Lore Alliance membership box on your screen to learn more. Um, becoming a member would help you increase your background and knowledge about this um, exciting technology. You'll meet new companies and enlarge your ecosystem, and you'll have a lot of plenty of chances to market your products and services. And then we have a very great event coming up in July in Paris, Lorwan World Expo. This is the official Lorwan event of the year and open to the entire ecosystem, both members and the non-members to attend. You can scan the QR code to visit the event website to learn more and register. With that, now is the time to receive your questions. Please input your questions on the questions box and we will be um, answering them shortly. All right, so um, so we've been already getting questions in the Q&A box, so this is, this is a very good time for you to put your questions so we can answer them um, in the remaining time until the top of the hour. Um, so with that, and, and, and few of the questions have already been answered, uh, let's go through this list. So the first question is from Caesar. Um, the question is, could you please summarize, clarify how due to cycle limitations should be applied, especially regional ones such as EU 868, maybe not due to cycle rec explained in the lower land specification. So, um, Olivier, could you take a step at this, please? Uh, yes, I'll uh, I will, I will try. So, the, um, in the lower land specific, uh, certification process, we don't verify the, the regulatory uh, duty cycle. So it's up to the device manufacturer when it tries to get, when it, when it gets a regulatory type approval from an authorized test house to verify that these duty cycle limitations are, are well implemented. And typically, uh, it's a measurement of a one hour and, and, and it's per subband. So in Europe, there is one subband that with 1% duty cycle limitation, another subband with 0.1%, and, and other subbands with, uh, so there are multiple subbands, well, not so many, three or four. And in each subband, you, you can have this 1% or 0.1% duty cycle, and you can add them. And the measurement time is, is over one hour. So again, the alliance is not going to verify that. But uh, the, the test house, which is going to give the regular type approval, is going to test that. All right. Thank, thank you, Olivia. Okay, the next question from David Paul. Is there a recommendation regarding the use of confirmed messages? Are there any considerations, or is this always beneficial? Um, Dave, can you uh, respond to that, please? Yes. Yes, thank you, Alfred. Um, so absolutely, we have some recommendations there that really, um, you know, they align with some of the restrictions that exist within the, the, uh, the unlicensed bands that we operate and the very nature of the fact that the gateways um, have the ability to receive many more messages than they can transmit. So we would recommend that the use of confirmed messages is used sparingly when it's really most appropriate and critical to the device operation. So generally you can categorize the device into two different uh, operational modes, 
if you will, kind of a heartbeat or a standard reporting mode, and then maybe an alerting mode where there's something that really needs to get delivered, has to get delivered to the network and needs that confirmation. Um, at that point, there are some pros and cons about using the LoRaWAN network level confirmation or using an end-to-end -end application level um, uh, confirmation that maybe are too, uh, too detailed to go through right now. Um, but yes, definitely use that you know, sparingly and for the correct purpose in order to keep the most amount of network resources available for the most number of devices. Thank you, Dave. Uh, let me get the next question from Jonas. What are the handicaps using ABP? So as you would remember from the slides, uh, ABP device skips over the over the air activation procedure, which uses the um, uh, uh, long-term key, app key to generate session keys. So by skipping that step, it needs to bootstrap using, uh, using a session key and also a device address that is pre-assigned to the end device from a network. So in a way, uh, an ABP device is already personalized for a given network server, whereas with the OTA device, um, device can be used in one network server at some point in time, and later it can be decommissioned from that network server and uh, provisioned on another network server. And given that the session keys are dynamically generated from scratch, there's no need to migrate the session keys, uh, and that, uh, that provides that. A uh, higher level of security for the end device and the applications running above that. Okay, um, the next one is from uh, well, Tandem Support. Uh, where could we find templates of all device profiles depending on applications, smart meters, parking sensors, etc.? Um, so, who would like to take that? Um, Dave, Olivier, you guys want to take a step or should I? Yeah, I can take a step. This is Dave. So, um, so certainly uh, the, the correct profile for the device is really going to be determined by the device manufacturer. Um, there is work that's going on the lower lines right now about providing a mechanism by which those profiles can be easily identified uh, and associated with the device and even potentially registered uh, with the network and looked up by the network uh, for those conditions. But ultimately, it's the device manufacturer that is responsible for defining the profile uh, for that application. If you don't mind, right. I can go ahead and take the, the next question. Too, sure, go ahead. Uh, for, yeah, yeah. Yeah, from, from Jeff, about a question about incrementing um, the, the dev nonce uh, has a maximum value of uh, 65535, and then at that point needing to, to, um, uh, to associate a new, a new join EUI uh, with uh, the device in order to, to do an additional level of, um, uh, of join procedures. So two things that are important here. So one of them to start with is, um, the, you know, the, the rate at which join messages are sent should be relatively infrequent over the life of the device. So certainly when the device first powers on, it will go through a period where it might try to join relatively quickly, but it should then very, very rapidly back off to very infrequently transmissions of those messages. Um, and that's, uh, there's a specific, this, that's now fully specified in 104 and beyond, um, but you can even be more aggressive than that, particularly in the long tail uh, of that, uh, of that uh, back off procedure. Um, secondly, the other thing to keep in mind is that the join EUI um, is, a, is a description, it's an address, a way, way to address the join server. So um, provisioning uh, another join UI, working with your join uh, server uh, in a, a provider in order to identify how to do that is, is certainly recommended. Doing that over the year is obviously a way to make sure that you're able to um, be, uh, have the most flexibility with that um, throughout the, device, uh, the device's life. Thank you, Dave. Um, okay, let me get the next question uh, from Titon Mesot. Um, not discussed in this talk, but I but related. Why the multicast group key was different than app key on 104, but merged in 1.1.0? Is it safe to use the same app key than multicast group key in 104? Well, actually, the uh, the multicast key and the app key, multicast group key and the app key cannot be the same key because app key is per end device. It shall not be used by any other end device, whereas the multicast key is, is a group key shared by multiple end devices. 
So in none of our specifications, they are the same. They have um, different routes and generation, and that's how we ensure multicast session is, is secured and it does not jeopardize the security of the end device. And, and the unicast uh, security and the multicast security is kept separate. Um, let me jump to this question from Manvendra Singh. So, um, um, Olivia Seller, if you can take a step at this. So, let me read the question aloud. For some of the use cases, the network connectivity detection requirements are stringent. The tender requirements are such that the device must know both of connectivity within four slot uplinks. To meet those requirements, use uh, confirmed uplink will not be a good idea to scale. Will multicast be more efficient rather than confirmed uplink? Yeah, oh, sorry, uh, <coughs> I was, was on mute. So, um, well, it's, uh, it's maybe it's not a good idea, but uh, at least it is a solution to, to use confirmed uplinks. Uh, and and you you don't need to have a one for four uh, uh, one downlink per four uplink uh, asymmetry. You can have lower than that if you consider the repetition of the frame. So that gives the network more opportunities. So it, it reduces a little bit this asymmetry. And 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 then yes, multicast or broadcast. It's it's. Is, is going to be more efficient. So uh, detecting a class B beacon uh, is a way to know that you have network coverage. And, and indeed, if the, if the uh, regulation allows that, uh, to detect a beacon as a connectivity proof is, would be much more efficient. So that's class B, and it's, and it's, ready, to, it's ready to go and deployed already in some network. OK. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dave to answer the next one. Uh, can channel plan be downloaded using EBP? Try to find if device can request channel plan, but didn't do that. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so, a, yeah, so certainly um, the uh, an EBP device is, is more than um, allowed, I guess, to uh, to also implement uh, the NAC command, and it's strongly recommended that it do so. Um, ABB devices have a lot of constraints and limitations associated with them, so it would really be unfortunate if the ABB device also didn't um, accept network configuration via the ABB commands. It would constrain it even, even more. Thank you, Dave. Um, so let me take the next one, uh, question number 17. New to device setup using TTN and OTA devices. Could you define who? Um, among gateway device code network server generates each EUI number and when they change. So we have uh, two EUI based numbers. One of them is the dev EUI, that's an identifier assigned to the end device. And the other one is the join EUI, that's the global unit ID assigned to the join server. So the join e, um, the dev EUI can be assigned to the end device by the manufacturer, or it can be overwritten or assigned by the device owner as well. But in either case, the dev EUI should be generated out of an IEEE OUI um, that is assigned or, or to the organization uh, putting that dev EUI or, the, or whoever is putting that dev EUI on the end device should be authorized to use that um, IEEE OUI prefix in order to avoid the collision. So again, it's either the manufacturer or the end user or, or whoever is deploying that end device for the dev EUI on the uh, end device side. And for the joint server, um, it is, it's the operator of the joint server should make that assignment, not the manufacturer. And the same rules apply in here. Um, the value needs to be um, based on an IEEE OEI and not, not just created randomly. Okay. Um, well, we have a couple more minutes uh, left, so let's squeeze in a couple more questions. So, um, uh, Olivia, can you answer the following one, question number 20? How is interference determined by the network server? Does the network server tell device to lower data rate, increase transmission power in areas of 
high interference. So the the um, the main uh, metric to to adjust the data rate is the packet success rate, is a packet or packet error rate, and this is derived directly from the frame counter. Each uplink has a frame counter, so if you observe all frame counters, then you have received all the uplinks. But if you miss some numbers in the frame counter, the, uh, there is some some errors going on. So that's the first metric, and then the second metric is the um, signal level of each packet or signal to noise ratio of each packet. So if, if in a situation there is a significant packet error rate and still a good signal level, a good signal to noise ratio, then it means that the packets have been lost to collisions or interferences. And then the network can react. So that's how the network typically would derive the presence of interference. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Olivier. Um, so among the remaining questions, there are only two left unanswered. Let's take them up, and then we will be closing the session. So the next one is, um, I hope you can take a step at that today, uh, question 22. As a manufacturer, I wonder if the LoRaWAN certification is enough to also test the suggested behavior of the end devices, the ones that are uh, captured in here. If not, can we test this with an external consultant? Um, well, yeah, that's the question. Yes, yes, absolutely, thank you. Um, so certainly uh, there are two kinds of tests that are typically required um, for the end devices. So one of them we strongly, strongly recommend is the Laurelland certification, which tests the compliance of the end device protocol stack against the, the specifications that, that we've published. So that's, that's critically important. You also usually have to do a local regulatory test as well. Uh, in most regions. Um, and so that will test some of the other behaviors that we talked about uh, as well. So the combination of those two things is usually um, very complete. The next step is really more application specific, and this is where you might uh, look for some external uh, support from a consultant, for example, around given a specific application behavior and requirement, how do you best use the, 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 the tools uh, of the end device in order to solve those problems. And we've touched on some of those here, but obviously, um, you know, there's, a, there's, there's many more aspects of that, that that could be considered. Thank you, Dave. And one last question, Olivier, if you can uh, handle, what type of antennas do you recommend for sensors implemented in manholes? Uh, simple answer. We recommend a good antenna, but uh, uh, it's it's the, the best antenna you can you can you can you can fit uh, for for the size, which is available on the on the end device. Typically, it's it's it's, it's usually a, a size performance trade-off. So, whatever size you can offer is going to be useful, of course. Mm -hmm. Just I'll add one more comment. You really want the antenna on the top side of the manhole cover if you can get it there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Great. So thank you, Olivier and Dave. So with that, we have reached the end of our webinar. Uh, we would like to thank you all for listening and also actively participating through your good questions. And as you know, we have already two more webinars lined up in the near future. Please do sign up, and we look forward to having you again. Thank you. <laughs>